Welcome to the Dashboard Effect Podcast. I'm Rick Thompson. I'm Caleb Oaks. Hey, Caleb. So today I wanted to continue our discussion from last week. We uh, spent some time talking about chat GPT and the likely arrival of AI tools to work with data. Um, and I thought this week it would be good for us to talk about what do you need in place in order to take advantage of that when it comes. Yeah. I mean, hopefully we can share our perspective on you know, what you should do if you're in charge of you know, some data at your company and you kind of want to get ready for this thing. You know, it's going to be an important uh it's, it's important, right? This is this is coming, and I think it's important to to stay on top of it and, and understand what you can do now to make sure that you're not caught, caught flat-footed uh, when when this technology get, becomes really, really relevant um, for your data. Yeah, and uh, I saw just a couple of days ago, um, actually I think it was on Friday, um, already some tools that are coming out to do data science work. And so if you've got your data in a place where you can – point these tools at it, you're going to be an, at an advantage, I think. Yeah, for sure. I know you've been doing a lot of research on it, on these types of things, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty astounding. I mean, it's still, you know, it's still early days. Um, there's a definite hype train <laughs> rolling right now, so some of that may moderate a bit. Um, but I think there's a lot of advantages in any case for any company to get data consolidated and integrated. Um, and you know whether you're doing it for this coming, these coming AI tools or not, there's a lot of other reasons. And I think there's sort of been an interesting evolution over the last five or six years. You know, uh, five or six years ago, um, when someone came to us to uh, build a data warehouse or do reporting, we would build a data warehouse, create AT ETLs to pull data in from different systems and have it sort of in a, a more traditional agile, Kimball-style data warehouse. Um, over the last couple of years, data lakes have really come to, to be the thing that, that we recommend for a number of reasons, um, and we can talk a little bit about that. So why don't we start with just describing what a data lake is. For some people, I think it's another one of those terms that's just sort of confusing and conceptually fuzzy. How would you describe a data lake conceptually to a layperson? Sure. So the, you can think of it as like a folder structure on your computer. You know, you've got folders, you've got files, all that fun stuff on your computer. Um, inside of a folder, you have maybe other folders, maybe files, whatever. But inside of that folder, you can have subfolders. So let's think about the data lake for a second. If you're up in your data lake, you're going to have that same structure. So you have a folder. And then underneath it, you could have other folders, or you could have files or whatever, but typically you have other folders. So what that would look like um, is like, your data lake folder, and then you double click into that, and then you see you know, your, your source system folder, so like HubSpot. And then you double click into that, and you'd see all your tables from HubSpot. So you can connect to those files and consume them and use them for your analysis or whatever you would want. So those files that you're connecting to, each of those files represents a table from the source system. And mm -hmm. I guess it's in some kind of fancy format that makes it. Yeah. Well, you could store it really however you want. I and mean, usually typically use a parquet. You would, yeah. Typically you would put it into something specialized for a, for a data lake that makes it yeah, it compresses it well and makes it easy to read off of the lake. But you can store other things like XML or whatever, you know, pictures, videos, CSVs. anything you want. Jason's, yeah, CSVs, anything. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. So I think that's a, a – I like that simple explanation. Obviously, there's a lot of technical stuff around how to interact with it well. How, to, how do you load it every day so that you've got um, up-to-date data in it? How do people access it? Well, it is, I mean, depending on your interface, it can be as simple as sort of clicking through. Yep. Uh, but in most cases, you're also going to build some kind of a semantic layer. Maybe not most cases, but if you're doing, if you're making the data available to regular business report writers, you're going to do that. So you're going to have a, a layer of metadata that someone can hook their Power BI or Excel up to or Tableau or whatever that makes it really easy for them to access the data they want from the data lake and we'll have the relationships to set up and yeah. you know, all that type of stuff. Right. I mean, a good example of that is some, some systems, one in particular called JD Edwards Enterprise or JDE, uh, the table names are all like these 
codes. Right. You know, they're like six digit Numbers codes. It's yeah. F005 and, you know, and it, it's no one's going to want to look at that when you go double click into your data lake and you see all these codes. Like that's what you would use something like that, like a semantic layer to where you're you've kind of abstract that like bad, hard to understand, convoluted uh, naming convention. And now you've got readable names that people can digest and know where to go get things from. Um, so that's what that's a good use case for something like that. But you know, a tool that you could just connect directly to that data lake with Power BI. You know, the nice thing about uh, again keeping things in the Microsoft stack the way that we do it with with uh, Azure and then using Power BI and Microsoft tools is that there's just connectors right to the data lake. Put in your credentials as long as you have access. You can also control access very granularly if you're in a, a data lake like that. You control access to the subfolders and stuff. Um, but you just go through Power BI. It just gives you a connector. You connect to it, and you get to browse the file structure like that and pull in your data, and you're off to the races. Yeah, so so you don't have to have all sorts of fancy modeling. Right. But it, as you said in the in the JDE example, you're probably going to want a yeah, semantic yeah, layer right. there. Um, and you can put other tools on top of your data lake too. Um, some companies are using tools like Snowflake, Databricks, that type of stuff. Um, in our case, um, since we're working in Microsoft Synapse, Synapse has great tools. You can even la layer Databricks, Snowflake on top of that if you need to. Um, access is really easy, and also initial loading is really easy and inexpensive compared with having to get to, you know, a, a, a fully thought out um, sort of Kimball model traditional database. Mm -hmm. You can load these tables quickly and get. Uh, what we used to call an ETL, but data pipelines, um, updating these every day for much, much more quickly and for much lower cost so that you actually can have your analysts accessing data really quickly. Yeah. Now you get all of your data relatively quickly and so it can be super powerful. You know, you obviously need somebody to, touch, to go in and actually make sense of it, but you know, it's, it's there and it's accessible. And, um, you know, we see a lot where, Power BI makes it seem so easy to just go connect to different data sources and stuff. In a lot of cases, that's true. But once you start getting down the line a little bit further, like publishing the report up to the to the Power BI service where you got to schedule a refresh and all of a sudden it's not coming from your desktop. It's trying to make a connection from some cloud source somewhere and you're getting all these errors and you're not really sure why. And like just having a, a central repository gets rid of all that. Yeah, there's a uh, in the PE world, there's there's other reasons for having a data lake. Maybe, maybe we'll talk about that next week. Um, so uh, where we got, how we got to this was thinking about all these coming AI tools. Um, and if you have that data lake ready and you're using it to do analytics and using it to do reports now, when those tools show up, you'll just be able to point it at that mm -hmm. and not sort of be trying to figure out at that point, okay, how do we get these tools access to our transactional systems? Right. Yeah, and I think that's that's really important as – you know, there's maybe not a mainstream tool yet. I haven't seen seen one anyway. But I think a lot of these AI tools, they're focused really on the more of the consumer, you know, B two C yes, type stuff. Definitely. And, um, that's gonna that's gonna fade, you know, and it's gonna be that B two B. I'm sure it's being worked up somewhere right now as we speak on, oh, yeah. on exactly what we're talking about, and it'd be it's it'd be a good idea to get ready for that. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing early examples of it that look promising mm -hmm. for sure. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to continuing the discussion next week. Good. Thanks, Brick. All right. Thank you, Caleb.